Community Foundation of the Oakville Heritage Trust has commissioned a project to preserve our town's history by recording and sharing oral histories of personal accounts of life in Oakville. The White Oak was launched on Dominion Day and Aunt Kate, who was 10 years old at the time, so Aunt Kate was born in 1857 and this was 1867 when uh, Canada was declared a dominion. And she uh, christened the boat and, and her father, my husband's grandfather, was the captain of the White Oak. But at one time, they, were, uh, they went up to uh, Stokes Bay on the Bruce Peninsula to, uh, they were carrying lumber back and forth. And they got caught in an early freeze and the ship was frozen in in the harbor. And uh, so they couldn't, they were, uh, immobilized and the crew consisted of uh, um, George Brock Chisholm, a captain, and his son Frank, who is my husband's father, and his son George, and uh, the twins, who were I think 12 years old at the time. And the youngest aunt had been left with the eldest sister who was married. And in the course of the, the winter, the boys laid trap lines to catch rabbits and whatnot for food. And uh, they had potatoes and carrots and that sort of thing. But sometime during that winter, um, something fell on the captain and killed him. So they uh, packed his body in ice until the spring and as soon as the ice was out of the harbor they started for home and Frank was sailing the vessel and they had to sail around to the Welland Canal and uh, finally to Oakville. And he was just 21 at the time. And that was quite a feat for a 21 year old. Were you at home safely? Yeah. She was very proud of her brother Frank. I remember her telling me that story. Well, I. I came to Oakville, first of all, during the war in 1942. I was stationed at Long Branch, a small arms school, and I used to come out once a week to uh, the convalescent hospital. Now that's uh, up on Kerr Street at Bond, and it's now uh, called Oaklands, and the seniors place behind there. But when I came out there, it was used as a convalescent hospital. And so that was my first knowledge of Oakville. And believe me, it was a very small place. I mean, Kerr Street, I, I, I don't think it was uh, paved all the way up. It was, uh, oh, it, as I say, it was just a little village. Well, it was very hard in the Depression. There were a lot of people at university who had been school teachers and they graduated and wanted to get a job, they would look for a job in school teaching, and a lot of them were only getting the government grant, which was $200. Some of them got paid in IOUs. It was very uh, hard. I can remember how much I paid for uh, residence. We, it was seven fifty a week. And the fees were uh, uh, school fees for arts and science were $50, but for a professional course such as engineering or uh, pharmacy, they were a little higher, they were $75.
I can't remember what my pay was. Something like $12 a week, I think. I came through here and I wanted a place by the lake. I've always liked the water. And so uh, my wife and I came through and fortunately were able to buy a house on Brookfield, which is opposite uh, Loblaws, and only one off the lake. And I used to feel so badly because I built a sitting out porch and it was all right in the winter time. <laughs> but when the leaves came out and a bunch of, uh, I think were maples or something, you know, weren't maples, I don't know what they were. And then you couldn't see the lake. And I remember saying to the chap who lived in the house there, would it be too much to ask you to take one of these out? Oh, he says, no, that gives me my, my privacy. When I sold the house and it was surveyed, I discovered the darn trees were on my property. <laughs> but that's beside the point. There's always some hitch. Always. So, no, I, I, I was in that house for three years. Very nice, very nice neighbors, very nice locality. I had nothing against it. It was just that my wife liked this house. And I had to put in a bid and I bought the worn doorstep. So I can blame my wife as I always did. These two lots here were deeded by Colonel Chisholm when he founded Oakville, and I believe it was in 1828. And anyway, when he founded it, he uh, deeded two lots to his groom, who was a David Alperson. And uh, the, his groom lived here, and he looked after his horses, as you know, and he was quite close. And uh, he, he, he was in it, and then the next thing that happened was in 18, uh, I think it was 1876, it was pulled down and this was built as a paint factory. It, it was a paint factory and it was red brick. The stucco or the white that's on it now, it wasn't put on until about 19, 1910, I think it was. But it, it was a red brick paint factory. Uh, and uh, then what happened after that was, um, uh, it became the first electric light plant for the village of Oakville. And uh, the generator stood in what is now my dining room. And it was only a few years that, because a bigger concern took it over. And so it was no longer under whatever it was. Yeah. And then of course the next big thing was when it became the tea room and guest house. Well anyway, what happened was, uh, uh, I was very fortunate uh, the people who lived here, the old timers, mm -hmm. like uh, <laughs> Bill McCree and and the Wilkes and people like that around here, you know, they all knew this place and the Dunlop Stewart and uh, and they, they they told me how it was used uh, simply as a summer place for a while, mm -hmm. and then uh, this the Edith uh, this. Uh, Edith Brown bought it as a tea room mm -hmm. and it became very well known as a tea room. And I've met people in different parts of the world who have known the Warren Dorset uh, as a tea room in Oakville. Well, I was fortunate that Miss Brown came to see me. It was Thanksgiving, first Thanksgiving I was in the house. That would be 1966. And she came in with two younger ladies and she said, I'm Miss Brown. I ran this as a tea room. I would like very much to see it again. And I said, I'd be very, very nice to meet you. And she was 96. She died the next year at 97. And she said that she was living in, not a nursing home, a retirement home <laughs> <laughs> in Toronto. And uh, she told me all about starting up the tea room, how she came down here and saw this uh, building and and that was it, and she said, I've been reading a book, and the book was about a house in the First World War, which is called The War and Doorstep, and fugitives from, uh, or displaced persons, whatever you like to call them, from Belgium and places like that, would get over by boat to England, and then they would be funneled into this house, and then out into different parts. So it was uh, it's quite an interesting novel but it has nothing to do with this house whatsoever. She just liked the name. And, and if I, in fact, I, I, I'm telling you, if I change the name, 
I would have been run out of town. <laughs> in fact, there was a bird's nest above the front door. And I had people go by and say, you're not going to take that down. And I began to wonder, have I bought the house or what have I done? But anyway, uh, my wife and, she, and I were in it, uh, been in it for, th well, I've been in it for 33 years. Helen was in it for just almost 30. And it was really a wonderful place because with the water here and, and oh, it was just nice. Yep, I went in on duty. I was with the Highland Light Infantry of Canada, which is from was Galt, okay. which is now Cambridge. Don't ask me to see Cambridge again, no. okay. but it was from Galt and Kitchener and Hesper and Preston and right up into Bruce County. It was Western Ontario, a very close knit unit, and I got to it just by luck, because. Uh, I was a very young chaplain. I just finished the basic training that we had to do in England, and by luck, uh, I, uh, see, <laughs> I was sent on a course. There were ten of us young chaplains, handpicked, and we were sent overseas right away. And uh, they sent us to Aldershot to take training, and it was called basic training, common to all arms. And it was called the DD and PP course, doctors, dentists, practice, and paymasters. <laughs> and that was one of the happiest months of my life. We had a great time. I mean, uh, <laughs> it was really fun. But anyway, towards the end of the course, uh, Senior Padre came down from CMHQ in London, England, and uh, told us what was expected of us. And uh, when he finished, he said, Are there any questions? And I said, Yes, sir. I said, Derwin Owen, who was, uh, his father was Archbishop Owen, I, I said, we were talking last night, and he said it would be his luck to be sent to a Highland regiment, and he hates the bagpipes and would never wear a kilt. <laughs> and I said, I happen to play at the bagpipes, and I want to wear a kilt. Can we do anything? And you know, th th this is how things fall into place. While I was standing there talking, the padre of the Highland Light Infantry who had mobilized, gone overseas with him, and been with him close to three years, was being sent back to Canada. And when he got back to his office on Monday morning, here's a message. Send replacement chaplain to the Highland Light Infantry in Bournemouth. <laughs> and he likely thought of me. And so I was posted before the course was over. Really? So that's how I got to them. And, and, and they were slated for D-Day uh, as part of well, the Highland Brigade, part of the 3rd Div. But we, we weren't the, the first ones in. Knitting. We were all knitting. We were all knitting socks. And I can remember they brought out unshrinkable yarn. Do you remember that? And I was lucky enough to find two skeins of green unshrinkable la la uh, wool because uh, my husband was uniform was uh, uh, green, mostly green, green and blue, tartan. So I was going to make him a pair of socks, and I made made them and sent them to him. Well, his but his uh, Batman complained about those socks because every time he washed them, they got bigger and bigger and bigger, and finally the heel was coming out over the top of his shoe <laughs> at the back. So they, they had to go back to the, the uh, to their research and their unshrinkable wool because that, the first lot didn't work. But we were uh, to go in, in a later wave, and the idea was that the uh, 9th Brigade, the Highland Brigade, we were to break out of the bridgehead and go to the other side of Carn. Well, that never happened for a month. But uh, we don't hear much about that, of course. But anyway, what happened with me was uh, the colonel came to me and he said, Padre, I don't know, don't know what to do with you. And I said, you're not the first, you won't be the last. <laughs> he said, no, what I mean is everybody who goes ashore has to be fari. And the Geneva Convention states that you cannot carry a weapon. 
So the only thing I can think of is, I'll put you with the rations and the ammunition, the three trucks to come in, and you can go in the last one. I said, okay. And it was to go in about 10 o'clock in the morning. And so we made a dash, and we got stuck on a wreck. Oh. And we lay there all day. And towards the evening, we got taken off by a rhino. And then when we got ashore, uh, it was pitch dark and no lights in the vehicles. And uh, I didn't know where we were to go. I knew we had to go to an assembly area, and, and his code name was Colin. And so I, I said to the driver, follow the one in front. So we were doing all right. And suddenly the darn vehicle conked out. So we had an awful time. It was all the, uh, oh, they had to waterproof everything for a wet landing. Mm -hmm. And so we jumped off and we tore all, all that off. And finally we got it going. And down the road came a, a, a Brit on a motorcycle and said, better look out there, they're sniping up ahead. I said, oh, that's good. So anyway, we, we, uh, we, uh, I said to him, you've got to make up on them. I don't know where we're to go. Well, he tore through the night. And finally I said, how far do you think we've gone? Oh, he says, five miles, ten miles. He said, I don't know. The poor kid was as scared as could be. I, I said, well, we better slow up. The last I heard on board the ship were only five miles inland. <laughs> and so he said, well, I do, sir. I said, well, you see those trees in there? back up into them. So we got off the road and backed in among some trees and we sat there. And every five minutes he says, what will I do, sir? He said, if I can do it. I said, just stay put. So finally, I heard some troops marching down the road and I thought, oh boy, I'll go out and ask them. And then I thought, no, I better not. They're marching towards the beach. They're rather <laughs> our fellows now treat to the juries. So we better stay put. So we did. And finally, just before it got light, you could almost sense it. I said, we've only one chance, get out on that road and make for the beach. So we got out in the road and we came into the village of Beni Samir, I found out later, and a provo ran out and stopped us and he said, where the, um, uh, he used a, a, a word that he shouldn't have used in the presence of a padre. Exactly. Uh, where have you been? I said, well, we're lost. I'm looking for an assembly area. And he said, I've been here on point duty stopping all marching personnel and uh, vehicles from going by this spot in the middle of the night some so-and-so went by and I couldn't stop them. I said that must have been us. So, but then when I got to the assembly area I discovered they had been bombed during the night. So it was just as well where I was. And then down came uh, the uh, transport officer and he says, Padre you need it up ahead. Get your motorbike out the truck and follow me. And I had a one cylinder, famous James it was called, a little putt putt thing. And he had a snorting Norton. So he said, follow me. So I followed him. And when we got up of it, he said, you're on your own. We're under observation. And away he went <laughs> and I putted after him. And when I got up to the unit, the colonel said to me, he said, uh, Padre, the medical officer and the medical sergeant have gone out by exhaustion. Will you lend a hand at the aid post until we can get a replacement? Now, I used to faint at the sight of blood, but <laughs> somehow, w when you have to do a thing, you do it. And 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 then when we got a uh, another M.O., he happened to be a lovely chap in the name of Jimmy Gibson from uh, Kingston, and he said to me, he says, you know, I'm just into the, into the army. I know nothing about infantry. I don't know what a platoon is or anything else. And he said, you look after the outside, now look after the inside. And he said, I'll only be here a short time until I can get a replacement. And so I did. And then when the first big battle came, then I took my Jeep and went in and brought them out. Picked up air. Was that right when you... It was first MC. Yeah, and I got my second one up in Germany. And I was put in for a third one, but I think they thought I was greedy. I don't know. <laughs> Strange as it may seem, D-Day wasn't my worst day by any means. No. I, I I think it was worse landing in the Scheldt at night from buffaloes. You know, buffaloes that go in water and land. Yeah. And these dash things, the noise they make. In fact, after I came back from overseas, I was stationed at Camp Niagara, and I was reading the Niagara Falls Review, and he said in it that Brigadier Churchill Mann 
was giving a lecture at the local high school. And I thought, oh boy, I'm going down to hear him. So I went down there, and he was talking on, no, f I don't know what you call it, flukes of the Second World War. Yeah. Uh, and he was saying one of the best was the landing in the shelf. So of course I pricked up my ears. And what had happened was we had to make this night attack, you know, these buffaloes. And the, the Air Force, when they were coming back from bombing in Germany, they dropped any that was left over at, in, in the shelf there. And, and the, these fellows, when they heard the noise of the buffaloes, they thought it was the bombers and they kept down. And so we got the first night. And if it hadn't been that, I don't know how we would have made out because we had quite a number of casualties on that first night. But, uh, oh well. Oh, Oakville has changed enormously. When I first came here, the town population was about 7,000. About 10,000 if you counted a little bit on either side. And uh, we all had to go down to the post office to get our mail because there was no postal delivery. You never locked your door when you went downtown. You didn't need to. Oh yes, Oakville was very different then. Tremendously, you have no idea. Uh, <laughs> I remember when Helma would be standing at the kitchen sink doing the dishes. If you saw somebody walking on the street, I wonder who that is. No, my goodness, is this, this, this front street? Uh, <laughs> there's more people and dogs walk on here <laughs> than, <laughs> than enough. But no, it's been completely changed. I mean, uh, everything above the QEW was considered country pretty well. We had a fish shop in Oakville that was run by a Mr. Herring and it was a real old country fish shop with sawdust all over the floor which he breaked with a rake and uh, he stocked a lot of different kinds of fish too. Well I had a soft spot for Bill Hill's grocery store Bill used to save canned milk when he got a shipment of canned milk. He used to save that mostly for his regular customers. He kept it under the counter. <laughs> no, he was very obliging, very helpful. It was quite an institution in Oakville, Bill Hill's grocery store. Yeah, <laughs> well, what gets me is you used to be able to walk uptown and there were three hardware stores. There's none there now. You used to go over to Loblaws and A and P and, uh, and then there was a little uh, uh, Korean uh, grocery store. And oh, it was just, uh, you know, and every time you walked uptown, you knew people. I mean, you didn't have to. Now, mind you, there's still a bit of that because most people up in the, uh, uh, well, the suburbs, uh, they go to the big stores, you know, in the big malls. And, and a lot of the people here, like, you go over to Loblaws here and you're bound to meet quite a number of your neighbors and stuff. And, and, and then the people seem to live in their houses one generation after another, you know, like, uh, they get their handed down and so on. No, it's, it's a very nice community, this. If it wasn't, it's so dashed expensive. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I know. Just can't understand it. Well, I used to ask people why they moved to Oakville. And they used to say, often say, well, we came out here on a visit and driving down Trafalgar Road and all these beautiful houses on either side and the trees meeting overhead, it was very attractive and that's what attracted us to Oakville. And Oakville building all these row houses, I think is defeating the reason why people move here in the first place. 
Oh yes, oh, oh, Oakwell is is a very nice place. They're very friendly. Now, I I can't do it now. I can't go out and work in the garden because I keel right over. But uh, people going by, uh, they, they just say how are you, and you have a little talk with them. And I I think it's a very small sort of <laughs> community and very friendly. No, Oakville was a very pleasant place. Still is. <laughs>